Okay, this is the last recorded class session we'll be doing this semester, and it's uh, about the great nonprofit. I want you to be able to identify the four myths about great nonprofits and then the corresponding truths. We'll talk first about revenue. The myth when it comes to nonprofits as it relates to revenue is that great nonprofits get all the revenue from reliable public fundraising campaigns. When we think of great nonprofits that are in good shape revenue wise, we think of the United Way, Make a Wish Foundation, March of Dimes, right? All these Red Cross. We think of these big organizations that are really good at public fundraising. The truth is that great nonprofits diversify their revenue and are resource driven, not dollar driven. As far as diversification goes, I think I've already told you guys the story about the director of the Make a Wish Foundation in the Greater Bay Area, how she's proud, how the thing she was most proud of was a pie chart. Uh, we can revisit that story in class, but uh, you know, diversification is something that keeps nonprofits alive, and it's a really important approach to revenue. The other observation is the difference between resources and cash. Most nonprofits think that the solution to all their problems is money, and that's not necessarily true. What they should be focusing on is resources. Um, in fact, ideally, you're going to do uh, well. Let's talk about resources for a second. So. <clears throat> Resources are all those things that can't be translated into cash necessarily. So they might be, th be things like access to important officials, um, volunteer time, uh, uh, free advertising somewhere, right? Uh, maybe pro bono legal services. These are all examples of resources that are available to you that are not cash. Um, resources tend to be tend to attract success, not necessarily money. In fact, sometimes nonprofits that are money laden, like they have lots of cash, they actually don't do well as a result of it. But um, if you're good at what you do, money money may come, but resources will definitely come. And resources are much more broadly available and useful to you. Um, money actually can scare away some resources. Some, some people will feel that if you've got tons of cash, then you don't need to worry about volunteers coming for example, or you might be getting pro bono legal services if you are a nonprofit without lots of cash, but if you're, sorry, right, and if you have lots of cash, then the attorney's less willing to do work for free. And in a certain sense, money is more expensive than resources because it's more rare for people. Some people will be happy to offer their time when they won't necessarily be happy to offer their money. That makes them, that makes money relatively more expensive. And the reason that's true is pretty obvious when you compare the two. Well, nonprofits really should be asking for both of these things. But the way you think about resources is that they're unique, but they're also cheap. <clears throat> unique in the sense that they can be used for a particular purpose, like if you have an attorney willing to do free legal work. You can't then sell that offer for free legal work somewhere else, right? But it's relatively cheap because the attorney is willing to do that, and it doesn't cost you any cash. Cash is expensive to you because you don't have as much of it as you do you know, offers for free services, volunteer work, whatever. But, but money is flexible, which is what's great about that. And, um, and, and so you need to be approaching um, you, the way you sustain your nonprofit by thinking, by being resource driven, not just cash driven. In fact, you can think of it as like you've got a bucket to fill and you've got a bunch of rocks and a bunch of sand. If the rocks are resources, they're unique, they're cheap, they're big, they're heavy, they're substantial. The sand is like cash, and what you do is you put all the rocks in the bucket first, and then you fill in the gaps with the cash, which is flexible and, and can you know, fill in the empty spaces. Okay, expenditures are another category that I want to talk about. The myth is that great nonprofits have very low overhead. The truth is that great nonprofits focus on outcomes, not overhead, and they treat their staff how their staff want to be treated. Here's an incomplete list of worthy overhead expenses. It includes training your employees, purchasing equipment upgrades, hiring additional support staff, doing outcome measurement, and hiring accountants for proper accounting and audits. None of these count as program expenses. But if you look at that list, that's what any healthy nonprofit would pay for, right? The problem is, is when we focus too much on overhead ratios, we push out the incentive for nonprofits to do these things, even though these are very important. Really, anytime you're going to spend money, you should be focusing on outcomes. And really, the simplest way to do that is to ask yourself two questions with every single expenditure. Will this help us what we do better, do what we do better, and how will we know if it helps us be better? If you ask those two questions in every expense, you'll make good choices with your money. And really, every nonprofit should be doing that. 
I do want to comment specifically on how nonprofit employees are treated, and it's because nonprofit employees face a downward pressure on their salaries constantly, right? Because donors don't like the idea of paying staff, they like the idea of helping people. Well, the truth is, if you want to be a nonprofit where people like to work, then you should do you should be a good place to work. I think the problem we have in the nonprofit sector is that we expect people to love why they do what they do, but not where they do what they do, right? And so we expect them to, and so unfortunately, a lot of nonprofit employees get really mistreated because, you know, the idea is their love and passion for the work should overwhelm any difficulties with the organization, and that's simply not the case. You can love the why of the work, but if you don't love where you work, then there's not much point to it. And so you want to do things that make people happy, employees happy, like compensate them fairly, have trustworthy supervisors, provide valuable training and material support, give them power to make choices, and, and create a friend, friendly culture and environment. Okay, the third category is an organizational structure. The myth is that great nonprofits are driven by charismatic founders. The truth is that great nonprofits have active strategy focused boards and accountable executives. We do a little bit of hero worship in the nonprofit sector. You know, we tell stories about the great people who started the great nonprofits over the last hundred years. But the truth is that uh, it's not the hero that in the end makes it work. It's a great board and uh, high standards of accountability for the executive officers. Really, a high-functioning board and executive team looks like this. Where Well, it doesn't look like this. This is a low-functioning one. A common problem I see in working with nonprofit organizations <clears throat> is a board that doesn't properly understand their role. And so what happens is an individual member of the board goes to the executive director and demands something, and then another board member does the same thing, and another, and so on, until all of them are requesting things. And even more inappropriately, in that last arrow that popped up, the uh, the board member is going directly to a staff person asking for something. This is not the right relationship between a board and an executive director. It's legally incorrect because individual directors don't have any, individual members of the board of directors don't have any authority of their own. But uh, it's also strategically unwise. Um, this is the right way to do it. Basically, the, all those individualized lines of communication should be eliminated and replaced with one voice. Um, coming from the board of directors uh, and you'll notice I also drew kind of a dotted line between the two everything on the board side we're gonna call strategy and everything on the staff side we're gonna call administration and that's should be the difference of focus between the two groups of people board should be focused on strategy and and staff should be focused on administration. Sometimes as a board member, you might go down into the administrative side, right? And you'll go down because you want to help, say, volunteer at a banquet. Well, if you do that, you don't do it as a boss or even as a co-equal of the executive director. Anytime you volunteer as a staff member, then you become a staff member and subject to the direction of your executive director or other executive officer. So, and then when you go back up to the board, then you continue being a board member. Um, also, sometimes boards of directors like to penetrate too far into the administrative side, and they like to sort of claim things that are administrative. Um, as Bill Holterstrom likes to say, and he, he's the president of the United Way of Utah County and does board trainings around the country, he likes to say that if the board of directors wants to choose the color of the carpet, then they have to be in charge of installing the carpet too. Um, you know, the idea is if you're going to take over any administrative decision making, then you have to be in charge of the administrative tasks that go along with it. Okay, um, you know, here's some illustrations of the difference between strategy and administration. On the strategy side, with, when it comes to operations, you've got core programs, you've got the office location, uh, you've got uh, the hiring of executive staff. Uh, on the administrative side, you'd, you'd leave your executives to decide on who to hire for non-executive positions, and you'd let them decide the important day-to-day -day activities. As far as finances go, the board of directors is in charge of things like the executive director compensation, making sure an audit is performed and approved, and that the budget is also approved. Now, you'll notice that just means budget approval. The creation of the budget is actually something that the administration does. Um, they're also in charge of all the bookkeeping and other records, and, and they're in charge of approving and processing all contracts and payments. 
really on the strategy side, you should see a board of directors focusing on like the strategic plan, for example, and broad governance issues, administration, they'd worry about things like a website or a document management. Really, if we were to sum it all up, the board should be focused on ends. They should be wondering and finding the answers to the question about where are we going, who are we, that sort of stuff. Whereas the staff, once they know the direction, they're in charge of the means and they decide how to get there. Just want to add a comment on, on board meetings. Sometimes you have boards, or exe in this case an executive committee, and the executive officer shows up and says, okay, here's the agenda for you directors. This is an inappropriate relationship. Um, John Carver, who wrote a great book about board meetings, in fact, it's kind of the seminal book on nonprofit boards of directors, he likes to say that board meetings are boards meetings, not management meetings for the board. And so when the executive director is always preparing the agenda, that's the wrong way to approach it. It should be the chair of the board that's, that's preparing the agenda, um, not the executive officer. Okay, and the last category is governance. The myth here is that great nonprofits are entirely trustworthy. Um, it, what th this is a myth not because it's untrue, but because it puts the focus on the wrong concept. The truth is that great nonprofits should operate to be above reproach. Um, above reproach means that they, for example, produce annual reports, that they post financials and, fi and other filings, that they have a conflicts of interest policy and they follow it, that they're transparent by default. This is the approach. They operate not just in a way that instills trust, but in a way that demands trust, right? Because their transparency and forthrightness is so obvious that it, people are forced to trust them because the information is laid bare. Anyway, that's it for this class presentation. Congratulations on getting through the semester. We'll see you all soon.